Hello everyone, and welcome once again to CS300 Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. I hope you're all staying safe and well in this difficult time. I wanna to talk to you today about agile process and practices. So we're gonna continue a discussion of sort of what it means to do agile by talking about some of the fundamentals and how that works out. As before, I'll try to separate clearly my opinions from things we actually know and things that are actually going on out there and uh, hopefully that'll be successful. So let's just start with textbook preconditions sort of for agile development. The textbook says, well, sort of these are the characteristics that make agile development work. It doesn't say that so explicitly, but it's pretty explicit. And the first thing they say is software products are usually standalone systems rather than systems composed of independent subsystems. And I, I find that sentence, that's a direct quote from our textbook, I find that sentence questionable, I find it a little sketch. Most software products, just like most software in general, is part of a system that has multiple components, like we talked about when we talked about the last week, you know, it's not a typical, for example, for a web app to have independent-ish subsystems, a back end, a front end, a database, all kinds of things that all have to work together to get your functionality. And that's before you consider the non-software parts of a lot of real world projects where software is part of some larger system. It says, well, Agile works when you, you're developing with co-located teams who can communicate informally. And of course, that's not really so much a reality in 2020. Sometimes it is, certainly right now it's not, right? Nobody's co-located because we're all trapped at home by terrible virus. But even when the virus is gone, the fact of the matter is that you work with people that are not in your time zone and you try to minimize communication, synchronous communication with those people, communication, direct communication with them in favor of things like email or uh, whatever that are asynchronous, that are stored and they can work with later. Uh, and even if they are in your time zone, you know, there's a lot of work from home, there's a lot of stuff like that going on. And so you really can't count always on co-located teams. Uh, and the conclusion here, just there's no need for formal documents, meetings, and cross-team communication. That's a weird statement. There's certainly a lot of meetings in Agile. They, we try to keep them minimal and short, but they certainly exist. There are not formal documents, but there's a lot of documenting going on still. And certainly, I don't know what they mean by cross-team communication, but certainly you're talking to each other as much as you can. You're just not doing it face-to-face -face all the time, although you do that when that's possible. So I mentioned processes and practices, and I think it's important to make that distinction. What is a process? Well, a process is sort of a collection of practices. So a process is a way of working. It's a way that you do something. And the way that you do something is by executing a bunch of little pieces, right? If you're a chef, you probably have a cooking process that you follow that involves you know, it has some phases, it has some practices, it has shopping and you'll have various practices around where you shop and how you shop. It involves prep cooking and, you know, you have various practices about how you do prep cooking and who does it and so forth. And when you've got all those practices assembled, you tend to execute the same general set of practices every time you cook something. Well, when we're cooking software, you know, we do the same thing. We, we find a set of practices that we collect together into a process, and we tend to execute that same general process whenever we build software, adapting it only where we need to to fit our situation. Because those practices were chosen to work well together and to get the result we want. And so it's really important when thinking about software development that you think about that, about what, how is it that I'm doing what I'm doing and what practices make it up. Let's talk about a few principles of Agile programming. Um, these are 
taken from the extreme programming literature, which again is very closely related to the Agile Manifesto we talked about last time. And I think these are all fantastic principles. I think they're absolutely unquestionably good ideas. Involve the customer. You really want the customer as involved as possible in your software development because they can guide you as to what they need. They can help you, they can constrain you when, you need to be, when they need you to be constrained and so forth. Embrace change. Understand that, you know, straw man waterfall doesn't work. That the stuff you decide you're going to do at the beginning isn't always going to be what you do at the end. That sometimes, and by sometimes I mean always, the customer will change their mind about what they want in the middle of the project. That's very, very common and you need to be prepared for that. You know, don't expect that you're, you're, you can be rigid about this. Develop and deliver incrementally. We talked a lot about that last time. I think it's clear after trying it a lot of different ways over a long period of time in the software engineering business, I think it's clear that building, taking a working piece and making a small incremental change improvement to produce another working piece is the way to build software. Maintain simplicity. Try as hard as you can not to make your systems too complicated. The 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, you can go back and find some just dinosaur great examples of systems that were just way overbuilt for what they were trying to do. There was just way more code than anybody could ever deal with. It required crazily giant machines to run it, and it required crazily giant armies of workers to keep it running. Uh, we don't want that. Make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And finally, and I've said this over and over again, and I agree with this 100%, I think this is really important, software is people. And, you know, focusing on a process, there's, there's this thing called Taylorism. Uh, Taylor was a guy in the old days who decided to improve efficiency in industrial processes by measuring things and making very specific changes. So the famous example was shoveling. He went out and measured a bunch of people's shoveling rates. This was in the days when shoveling manually was still a common thing. And sort of developed optimal shovel full sizes for the workers to use and shovels per second that they should shovel and sort of bullied everybody into doing that and then showed that the efficiency of the overall shoveling operation went up. I hate Taylorism. I think most people hate Taylorism. And I think the subsequent studies have mostly showed that Taylorism doesn't work. You can't treat people as parts in some kind of machine. And so you really want to focus on treating them as human beings and figuring out how to get the best out of actual human beings and how to have them be productive parts of the organization. So the extreme programming movement, which is a little fellow kids, but there we are, was an attempt to back away from heavily waterfallish project projects in the 1980s and uh, was really the forerunner of today's agile methods really the inspiration for most of today's Agile methods. Here's some practices the book lists that, that were standard, our standard XP practices. Frequent small releases. We've talked about incrementalism, absolutely. Continuous integration, meaning have the product in a state where it can always be built, have the product in a state where it can always be run. Test-first development. Write your tests bef early before you even write code. That's a fantastic plan and a really good one. Try to design as simply as possible. We've talked about that. Refactoring is the idea of being willing to take your code and do gross violence to it, to throw things away mercilessly, to move things around mercilessly, to rename and reshape your code so that it fits your needs better. Having a customer on site so that you can talk to them. This, there again, this customer interaction idea. Sustainable pace, not doing the death march thing. There's a very famous old software engineering book by Ed Jordan who's, that's titled Death March. Uh, the phrase, you know, popularized the phrase in the software engineering community, this idea that when uh, a project is behind or having difficulties, 
the idea is to increase effort and that turns out to just typically just produce a product that's farther behind and has more difficulties because if you try to work faster than humans can, things go horribly wrong. Pair programming is a really interesting idea. We'll talk briefly about it, but it's kind of fallen out of favor after a long heyday of being in favor. The idea is that two people sit and program together on a single piece of code, and that sounds very inefficient, but there again, efficiency is hard in software engineering. You don't get to sort of intuitively guess what's going to be efficient and what's not in the long run because human beings are surprising creatures and you'd think that if you took two programmers and put them on one piece of code then that piece then in the same amount of time you'd get half the work out of them and it doesn't turn out that's the way it works at all it turns out they work faster and more accurately on that piece of code and at the end more sustainably and so there you are Collective ownership, this idea that's due to Glenford Meyer and some other psychologist people that sort of you want everybody to feel that the software you're building is a collective effort, that you all succeed or fail together, that it's everybody working as a team. And incremental planning, planning as you go, which is one of these ideas we talked about a little last time. I mean, let's look at these. Some of them are sort of platitudes that are sort of pie in the sky there are apple pie kinds of platitudes right of course you want a simple design there's no literally no software development methodology i've ever seen where we favor complex designs is part of the software <laughs> development philosophy you don't do that you know nobody wants nobody wants complicated they all want simple even the people doing crazy formal method stuff abriel's b method or whatever we're like, well, yeah, we make it as simple as we can. It's just hard to make it simple when you're trying to do this stuff. Um, you know, so, similar with sustainable pace. Nobody's like, oh, yeah, we all want to work everybody till they drop. Eh, of course you don't. But, you know, the question is, how do you avoid that? How do you get simple designs? How do you actually achieve sustainable pace? Some are sort of idealistic. You know, collective ownership is fantastic, and you should always try for it in your project, but you may not always receive it. Some of them are, you know, pair programming, like I say, it feels not new even today. Probably most of you have never worked in a situation where you explicitly did pair programming. And yet, 15 years ago, there was a lot of experimentation with it. And there's a lot of stuff in the software engineering literature, the academic software engineering literature, which, yes, is a real thing, to suggest that it can be a really powerful tool for getting better code. Um, so that's sort of the agile view of things. And I wanted to give you that view because that's sort of, like I say, the foundation for a bunch of more modern methods that built on these agile ideas to build the kind of stuff you're working with. And in particular, what we'll talk about next is something called Scrum. And Scrum is a particular kind of agile method slash extreme programming process, which tries to capture and codify some good practices for how to build software in an agile way. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you much for listening. Please stay safe and well in this difficult time. And I will talk to you again sometime very soon.